All right, I want to welcome you to the panel session on current issues in financial market regulation. My name is Kathleen Weiss Hanley. I am a professor at Lehigh University. Uh, we, today we have a very distinguished panel. And we're quite honored to be able to have um, each of them join us today. Let me give you a little bit about their background, and then we'll be talking more about sort of some issues that are on the regulatory um, spectrum that, that are interest that are interest that are being uh, proposed or are under consideration. So I'll start with John Coates. He's the John F. Coogan Professor of Law and Economics at Harvard Law School and the research director of the Center on the Legal Profession. I'm going to take my most of my introduction is to their regulatory uh, background. Um, Professor Coates has written extensively on uh, cost-benefit analysis and others. He served as the acting director for the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC, as well as the general counsel. Uh, he has served as the chair of the investor as owner subcommittee of the in investor advisory committee at the SEC. And his research specializes in corporate finance, most recently on ESG disclosure and SPACs. S.P. Kotari is the Gordon Y. Billiard Professor of Accounting and Finance at MIT Sloan School of Management. He has had a number of positions both in industry and in academics. Most recently, he was served as the Chief Economist of the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the SEC. His expert research expertise, as most of you know, is in accounting. And most recently, he has been working on, on commission savings and execution quality for retail trades. Jonathan Sokoban is a senior vice president and chief economist at FINRA. Uh, he, has, uh, he oversees a team of researchers who gather and analyze data on securities firms in order to inform the policymaking at FINRA. He has held uh, many leadership positions in regulations uh, in the Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury, at the SEC. He's been the acting director of what is now known as DIRA, as well as a deputy director there as well as the director of the Office of uh, Risk Assessment, which was rolled into DIRA at some point. His most recent research is on dispute resolution and securities arbitration. So I'll take a few minutes and allow each of our panelists to make some opening remarks, and then we'll jump into the uh, issues. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, uh, and we will be more than happy to answer them for you if time permits. We think uh, we may not go for the full two hours, but we'll see how it goes. So, uh, John Coates, why don't we start with you? We'll go on alphabetical Great, thank order. you. Okay, very good. Um, I benefit from that sometimes. Um, uh, Kathleen, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Delighted to be able to participate along with uh, uh, very, very distinguished colleagues in the space between academics and, and regulation. It's, a, it's, um, it's an area that I think this audience in particular should be able to lean into. I think financial research can and has contributed quite significantly to good law and to good law reform. Um, you know, to note, I'm enough of an economist to note there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between relevance and scalability. My own take is socially, we have too many people doing asset pricing theory and macro theory and not enough people doing applied finance. Um, but you have to kind of choose your place on that trade-off spectrum dimension uh, for yourself. I only occasionally have a voice in hiring decisions in those areas. Uh, when I do, I say what I just said. And sometimes it seems to matter. Um, from the SEC perch, I just played a role in this past year. I will say that uh, maybe a little something that I hadn't quite thought about. The kind of research that that directly affected me and others that I was discussing topics with at the agency while I was there um, was research that had had some the following characteristics. It drew on uh, empirically available um, disclosures, uh, which lets researchers not just model, but actually do some data work and come up with evidence, um, and particularly where they can draw some inferences about non-obvious patterns. And, and that tended to be where the disclosure was partial, but not full, where you could glean something from the evidence out in the world, but where um, uh, kind of settled intuitions and understandings were not fully 
fully um, fully settled. And so I think that's particularly true. I'll note uh, SP is followed by another very distinguished economist in the chief economist role there, Jessica Walker. Many of you in the audience probably either know her or know of her. And she reads your work and she knows it and she knows it really well and she's listening and, and reading. So I'll, I'll uh, on her behalf, whether I, she didn't tell me to say that, but um, uh, I'm quite sure she'd be happy with my inviting you to, to think of her as you're doing your, your research over the next year or two. Um, quick word about um, uh, some things on the agenda. And these are examples of what I just said. So we've got coming up soon climate, human capital, retailization. There are clearly going to be rules in the first two, maybe in the third space, um, but there's still even the proposals are still being formulated. So there's lots of time in a regulatory sense, maybe not academic, but months and months before uh, kind of those things are going to be settled. And so if you've got work underway or could get underway in those spaces, those would be particularly useful. I'll flag two that are already proposed. The Rule 10B fiber form that's pending and the buyback disclosure reform it's pending. Those are, I can tell you, directly motivated by academic research. Um, Alan, uh, Kathleen, help me with his last name. Stanford Jack. Jack, Jack. Uh, Thank Alan Jacqueline. Um, his management science piece from 2009. Uh, further work with Todd Henderson, who's a law professor at Chicago, Jonathan Millian's work in our QFA, all of those um, directly. And the reason those were influential is because they not only were sort of about the general topic, but they got into institutional details and made some points that are pretty compelling, although not ironclad, right? And that's the, the interesting space, I think, that academics can really help in. Buybacks, likewise, lots of research in this area. I'll just call out um, work by Yangmei uh, Ch Chang, I think it is, Jared Harford and others uh, on bonus-driven buybacks. Um, there's a JSE piece on the real effects of buybacks. There's general corporate finance pieces by Peter Sharaki and others, these, these are all things that in the buyback disclosure space helped uh, kind of motivate the idea that our current disclosure system, while better than it used to be before 2003, was far from ideal. And there was lots of room to move towards what other countries already do, which is much closer to a real-time disclosure of buybacks. Um, and, and I should just say that's totally separate and apart from the more general political fight about buybacks. And the last thing I would say is in SPACs, there's another area where we've got some good research underway, Jay Ritter and colleagues, um, some law professors, Michael Klausner and others, Michael Dombra and his colleagues from UC Berkeley have a good paper underway on SPAC forecasts. And that's another example where there's clearly disclosure, SPACs have to make disclosures, but there is, I think, a, a correct perception that a lot of the more important institutional details are not fully being disclosed in the current regime. And the other thing I would add is SPACs have been a total moving target. If you look at the not only the bubble in them, but the outcomes, the process, the institutional details, they've all been changing over the last two years, making it a really ripe field for, for good research. I'm happy to answer questions about any of those things, and I'll stop for now. Kevin. Yeah, we'll definitely be hitting on many of those topics. So if you have questions as they come up, please ask them. SP? Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, really uh, happy to be delighted to be on this panel on current issues in financial market regulation. Uh, <clears throat> my two years at the SEC, they, they have given me a taste for conceiving, articulating, and designing regulation, and also getting it across the finish line. It's not as easy as we think uh, even if some regulation is thought of the comment period and by the time uh, what comes out in the end, it can look quite different from uh, where we started. Uh, but but there, there is a bit of an art, bit of a talent involved in getting regulation across the finish line. Uh, <clears throat> regulation is, <clears throat> in my opinion, is almost like a daytime soap opera. Uh, it's nonstop and continues to unfold <clears throat> as the world changes. Uh, there are new technologies, new products, new organizations, new economies, all rattle the market and create a demand for new regulation. And the staff, <clears throat> the chair, <coughs> excuse me, the chairperson, as well as the other directors, commissioners, the staff, <clears throat> they are all thinking about what might <clears throat> help <clears throat> the market in terms of um, <clears throat> investor protection, 
as well as capital formation and efficient markets. Uh, and then they proposed regulation. Um, <clears throat> but I think a point to remember also is that the political and economic philosophy also influences the selection of issues for regulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> several issues are on the burner today. Uh, some are due to certain popularity of SPACs and cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, whether it's a security or not, that's it's at itself an issue and therefore how much SEC can regulate that. But SPAC certainly, and, and John, you, you mentioned about that. There are others due to concerns about ESG issues, climate in particular. So that has led to proposals for new regulation, disclosures. <clears throat> and then there are still other issues that are more longstanding like share buybacks that John was mentioning because of a longstanding belief among some that share buybacks are an instrument to benefit incumbent management at the expense of current or prospective shareholders. Uh, <clears throat> or there is payment for order flow that uh, Kathleen, you mentioned that uh, because of the belief that conflicts of interest cause harm to retail investors who channel their trades to entities that entice them with zero commission trades. So there are a number of reasons why different issues come up and they, they are currently uh, on the radar for the uh, commission, some they have already mentioned, and some they must be in the hopper. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one final point, uh, two, two final points. Uh, one is, I think, how we view regulation. Uh, in my opinion, regulation ought to be designed to protect investors, promote efficient markets, but also facilitate capital formation and economic prosperity by crafting regulation that is helpful to businesses. I think having a dark view of businesses is not helpful. Regulation ought to view businesses as a force of good for the society <clears throat> and SEC regulation is helpful to them just as it is helpful to in protecting investors. <clears throat> Finally, there was some comments about uh, both Kathleen you said and as well as John uh, emphasized academic research versus regulation relevant research. And clearly, you know, <clears throat> uh, we would like more regulation relevant or policy relevant research, but that's a different animal compared to academic research. Now we might like it or not, but academic research tends to be more hypothesis testing. So uh, in order to get more hypothesis testing, it tends to be narrowly focused. It tries to look for carefully identified some samples or settings that enable the researcher to say something about test of a theory. Now, we might say whatever we want, but when it came to regulation or policy relevant research, uh, it was not the individual piece of academic research that was helpful, but the mosaic that is created by a set of academic papers that I thought informed me at least when I was looking at an issue. For example, share buybacks, people immediately jump to the uh, academics would say, well, what is signaling theory or something, or is there some inside information that is being conveyed by management through share buyback decision? And the answer is yes, of course, that is true. But on the other hand, there are 800 billion, 900 billion or a trillion dollars of share buybacks that take place. Is vast majority of that intended or designed to convey some inside information, or is there something broader than that that is taking place? That is the sense in which I think the policymaker has to keep in mind what the landscape is and not necessarily focus on very carefully selected some sliver of a sample where a particular theory is being tested and some conclusions are drawn. Uh, let me pause here. And uh, once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity and, and look forward to the discussion. I bet it would be quite provocative. So. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you and, and an honor to share it with my distinguished colleagues here. Uh, as the active regulator in the room, I need to start by letting you know the comments I'm gonna make today represent my own opinion and not necessarily that of my employer, FINRA. 
Um, I think it may be useful to take a second for those of you who are not familiar with FINRA. We are a non-governmental regulator. We take not a cent of uh, government or tax money. We are the primary regulator of broker dealers in the United States. Any broker dealer that has an account for a customer by act of Congress has to be a member of what's known as an SRO or a self-regulatory organization. And FINRA is the SRO for broker dealers in the United States. As such, we're responsible for uh, our own rulemaking, enforcement, and examination of our rules. We have delegated authority for federal securities law in some cases and SEC regs as well. So we do enforcement. We do investigations, we do surveillance, we do rulemaking. We are also supervised by the SEC, which makes kind of a, an interesting balance because uh, we are at the same time the SEC's partner in many cases in the regulation of this activity, but we are also subject to inspection and examination by the SEC and its oversight. And in fact, when we want to promulgate a rule, we actually don't adopt our rules. The SEC has to adopt every rule that FINRA makes. We are, uh, there are, by the way, there are other self-regulatory organizations in the security space. They're usually attached to for-profit exchanges. We are the only non-for-profit SRO in the securities business. All right, enough about FINRA. Um, um, if you have questions, of course, happy to answer those. Uh, so Kathleen mentioned that I am responsible for the Office of the Chief Economist. I'm also responsible for the Office of Financial Innovation at FINRA. And as such, I oversee a team that's responsible for understanding um, basically the, the economic impacts of the current state of the world in our, in our space and the potential impacts of, of regulation. So that means we do a lot of prospective work, the kind of work that, that uh, SP's team does for rulemaking at the SEC. We also engage in um, a very active retrospective rulemaking agenda. Um, you know, SP used the very sexy uh, description of rulemaking as, um, as soap opera, uh, a very unsexy way to say it. It's kind of like slapping, every time you put a new rule, you're slapping a new paint, a uh, new coat of paint on the wall. And you don't always know what the interactions are going to be with the coats that have been on there before. And it turns out that spending some careful time thinking about what the rule set is, not taking the world um, pre-rule, pre as working effectively or not, turns out to be really important because a lot of the economics of securities regulation, I've spent over 20 years in this space, is really about the structural frictions that have been created by a set of rules that were, were thoughtful at the time, but, have, but the world has changed substantially since the time in which those rules were established or adopted. So our team works on a variety of topics. We've talked a little bit about the equity markets and equity market structures, the impact of zero commission um, and, its impact and its effect on retail investors. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit about meme stocks and uh, you know, those kinds of issues that have come up more recently and the impact of, of options trading uh, alongside of equity trading in retail investors. We can talk about the order routing decisions of broker dealers, both for retail orders, but also for institutional orders. We can talk about fixed income markets, which are changing very rapidly. There is more uh, electronification of those markets. There's a more pressure on those markets. Uh, we're doing some work right now in pennying, which is an activity that we've seen sort of you know, occur historically in the equity space. And now we're starting to, to sort of ask questions about what that might mean in the fixed income space. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, you also mentioned issues like dispute arbitration, uh, arbitration and dispute resolution. We're working in that space. We're, we've got some work going on right now on private placement memoranda and, and the information content of those. Um, a number of, of research projects, will, which I'm hopeful that we'll touch base on uh, over the course of, our, of this conversation. Let, with that, I will stop and turn it back to you. Uh, we'll begin by talking some, about some rulemaking that's uh, been proposed, and then we'll go on 
to talk about some issues that are at the forefront. I see there are lots of questions coming in. So if panelists want to answer them, some of them we will get to in our talk today. So, so hold on for that. But uh, mentioned uh, previously, I'd like to start a little bit with this issue of share repurchases, because as we know, this is something that Congress is very much uh, aware of and has put some pressure, I believe, I, I don't speak for the SEC, but put some pressure on the SEC to do something about it. Uh, there seems to be an impression that share repurchases are not good. So I thought maybe we could uh, open that up for discussion and begin there. If, if, if you'd like, I can say a couple of things, Kathleen. Um, um, the politics of buybacks are complicated. Um, I think to start where Kathleen ended, there is this kind of vague idea that they're um, somehow responsible for uh, job loss or for um, less productivity in the economy more generally. And I, I, you know, there's a mismatch between those concerns at a minimum and the mission of the SEC which is not about um, industrial organization. It's not about tax policy to the extent that you think tax issues are somehow involved in buyback use. Uh, and it's not really, the SEC is not really even the direct primary law setter for corporate governance, which might play a role in the interaction of buybacks and, and, and job creation. That's still left to the states, Delaware law and Delaware courts really are the principal uh, driver there. There is a role the SEC plays in corporate governance. And so some of the politics that Kathleen alluded to does spill over under the SEC. And that's maybe a, a minor but partial cause of the, of the current proposal to require more disclosure. Um, I think though, if you look at the SEC's proposal um, and read it carefully, that's not really what this proposal is about. What this proposal is about is the fact that um, companies are free to announce buyback plans. They frequently do, and they actually have to do on the stock exchange rules, um, and then not execute. Something like a third of companies that announce buyback plans buy not a single share over the following year. And then there's a related concern that um, the evidence is pretty good that buybacks are more frequently used uh, when CEO bonuses are tied to earnings per share or other ways in which buybacks can have an impact on compensation outcomes. That doesn't necessarily prove that buybacks are bad in some way, but it does suggest a need for more information on a real-time basis. Currently, the disclosure has lagged quarterly reporting, so it could be months before the actual buybacks are disclosed. Mm -hmm. And so the rule that's been put on the table is not really directly related to the overall concern about buybacks, but really a much more targeted one that's about disclosure, and that's in keeping with the SEC's mission. So I'll stop there. Uh, <clears throat> just to, uh, <clears throat> I, think, I think, John, you summarized it accurately. There are the uh, disclosure issues, and then there are the uh, more substantive, uh, do buybacks crowd out investment, that kind of concern or are buybacks used <clears throat> to boost share price and therefore compensate and thereby compensate managers excessively. Uh, those are some of the concerns that some people have voiced and they, they, those are the kinds of statements that I think uh, attract a lot of attention in financial press or elsewhere. And I think uh, evidence is rather compelling that those, those reasons are uh, less uh, or, or almost non-existent uh, or, or not influential. Uh, there might be some isolated cases where some uh, idiot CEO tries to use buybacks to influence some certain things, but uh, literally hundreds of billions of dollars of buybacks that are taking place, uh, evidence suggests that they are neither crowding out investment, nor are they uh, influencing compensation uh, or nor are they 
resulting in stock price manipulation because, you know, as I said, buyback as a, at an aggregate macroeconomic level, uh, they have been uh, lit, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars each year. Uh, as far as disclosure, I think the, the, the point is well taken. If there is some concern that, you know, some of those concerns can be addressed by a little additional disclosure, perhaps that may not be overly imposing. But I think the, uh, the corporate community fears is that, that uh, it will start with some additional disclosure, but the real aim is to either tax share buybacks or to, to prevent share buybacks as they are prevented in many other parts of the world. Uh, and I think that uh, I hope uh, evidence guides uh, both the SEC as well as Congress in terms of resisting the temptation to, to uh, do something to uh, shelf buybacks. So this brings, I think, up an interesting point that you know the comment process is really important in determining what the final rule looks like. So um, I think, how would you view the audience using the comment process to add relevant research to an area such as buybacks? For my take, I would say that public comments from academic researchers are typically, not always, but typically the most useful and most likely to be read of any kind of comment made. Trade groups always comment, and unfortunately, they tend to reflect the interests of their trade members. They're not useless. They do provide information, but they're often quite biased and sometimes openly so. Um, the public generally often comments, but Frankly, you know, many public commentators are not terribly well informed, and many of the letters are form letters which don't provide marginal information of any kind. And that leaves, frankly, a very small subset of public commenters who can actually move the process in a pretty meaningful way. And I would say everybody in this audience uh, should think about their research in that light. If you've got a research paper that's relevant to a rule, by all means, just file a comment and link to it and summarize how you think the relevance would, would affect the rulemaking. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, and, and when we were doing the economic analysis, uh, literally every comment had to be addressed. So, so the staff uh, looked at it quite carefully, all the comments. I think the real challenge that both academics and, and the staff face is the following. Uh, academics, because of their research, they feel very strongly they think that their findings are generalizable, which may or may not be true, okay? And the staff has real difficulty figuring out which comment is generalizable or which evidence is generalizable and which one is not. And to some extent, they are somewhat cautious. So, so almost everything is generalizable to them because less at a later date, they would be blamed by saying that, hey, you ignored, you know, look at it, it was written black and white and you chose to ignore it. So, but that, that is the challenge that, uh, and, and academics will never resist the temptation to say that, hey, you know, their findings are not generalizable. You know, that, that's just not in their DNA. They, they, to have a desire to have more impact, they would uh, either be silent or they will make some, as, as Kathleen, you were saying in the discussion section, that is their opinion, but they, they, it might be exaggerated opinion perhaps. So, so that's, that is the real challenge. But uh, as John said, uh, the best source of uh, commentary does come from many academics uh, because they, they are very thoughtful. They have thought about the issue for a long period of time and, and they, they also marshal the evidence. This notion about marshaling the evidence is actually an important one. As, you know, as, a, as a consumer of these comments, uh, you'll get a lot of comments that say, um, this particular rule is going to impose a massive amount of costs, and as a result, it will disrupt this industry, it will disrupt this, the provision of this service, mm. it will cause a whole bunch of, of you know, uh, mm. firms to disappear. And it's not that that may not be the case. It, may not, it, it also may not be the case that that's not an, a potential of the rule. The problem that we have is that uh, uh, most comments have a perspective or an opinion, 
but what they don't actually have is supporting evidence, right? And I think what makes academic letters more impactful is that they both have the perspective informed by research and other um, experiences, but it also, the best letters also build in the evidence that goes with the perspective that's being put forward. And whether you're engaging with a regulator as an academic who is an expert in a particular area or as an interested party, anytime you can combine both evidence and perspective, then you're going to be much more effective in, um, in, in, in being part of the regulatory process. So I want to move over oh, please, to, could... go, on, go ahead, sure. Sorry, let, let me just add one real, real quick little micro point. One of the things that regulators kind of must do as a matter of law, not only is to propose the rule for comment, but to lay out some alternatives. And the questions in the proposing releases are often related to the alternatives. And I think probably the most likely, you know, true direct impact that research could have is if you can identify a, 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 an alternative that's already on the table, it's in the proposing release, and where there's actually a question in the economic analysis section or in the overall section that invites comment on evidence related to the choice between the main proposal, between the status quo, and between the alternative. If you've got something like that, if you've got evidence that's directly relevant to a question so posed, that actually can result in change. It can actually result in the rules being revised uh, in the final form, maybe being reproposed, but in any event will certainly cause people internally, as SP said, they will think about it. You will get commissioner's attention uh, if you can uh, hit that kind of a micro point. I'll stop. So uh, one, one proposed rulemaking I'd like to turn to is that on securities lending. So Jonathan may be able to tell us a little bit more about sort of the data. This is a data issue. And as economists, we're always looking for new sources of data. So this has the potential to open up a data set that has been fairly opaque in the past. So Jonathan, tell us a little bit about sort of the securities lending market issues that would potentially lead the SEC to think about making it more transparent to everyone. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, as a matter of course, I'm not going to comment on the SEC's open rulemaking. Um, but in case you don't know a lot about this market, securities lending is around $1.5 trillion securities and loans in a given year. Uh, about half of that is in the equity space and about half is in the fixed income space. There's an estimated 60 to 90% of the equity activity that's actually going through broker dealers. And so um, there isn't a, um, let's call it, a, a, there are sources of data in this market, but they are private sources and they're typically give to get models. So if you're a broker dealer and you provide your information, uh, you will get to see the full set of information that's available uh, to that particular purveyor, which means that there is no complete and um, complete set of information that that's that exists, and people are seeing different parts of it. And, and actually, this is a place where there is some academic evidence. There are a couple of papers, uh, one by Kolinsky, uh, um, Reed, and Ringberg, where they show that this is really uh, sort of a high search cost market, and as a result the amount that different parties pay for stock lending, stock borrowing is, can be very different. And so it's a place where we can create more efficiency and potentially more liquidity in this market and, and fairer access if there were more broad information. So that's sort of the, the direct story of the stock lending market. There's actually another side to this, right? Which is, which is the, the shorting markets, because in the United States, um, you, have to you have to be able to cover your short and you can either do that through a borrowed share or what's through called a locate, um, meaning that you have the ability to go and borrow that share and deliver it if you need to. And again, whether it's direct through the borrow or indirect through this sort of locate process, your ability to 
make a statement that you can cover the short is, is um, impacted by the availability and the pricing in the stock borrow market. And you know, we saw, again, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the meme stocks and that kind of stuff. And particularly if you think about what was happening with uh, GME and those other stocks, and you could look to the report that SP and uh, worked on, I think before, probably before he left, I know that, that, that uh, DIRA and Trading and Market spent a ton of time on a report that they published. Um, one of the things that you saw was in fact, that the amount of short interest in GME and in, in, in GameStop was like 40% larger than the total shares outstanding. So how does this happen? It happens through rehypothecation, kind of what we saw in the securitization market in, in 2008, 2009, right? Uh, here it's happening in the stock lending market. And because you had a set of people who kept relending the shares, where as an economist, you might think that when the demand for borrows gets high enough, the price will move up and make the economics such that it's that the arbitrage isn't as worth it. It didn't happen here in that same way. And so providing more information on the, on the stock lending market and the price of borrowing combined with the short interest market, uh, short interest uh, information might actually provide market participants more information about what's really going on in that space. Jonathan, you're, you're, you're right. <clears throat> uh, I'm all for more information there. You know, I, it, it's, it's really, there's no excuse uh, for why that information should not be available more broadly. Uh, that's number one. Number two, it will also, uh, not only that, the borrowing costs that might be facilitated or, or they might be more competitive, uh, but I think, Another way of saying that is the friction in the market uh, to make markets more efficient or you know, friction that prevent markets from being fully efficient. Uh, I think those frictions would be lower. And then coming to the GameStop, uh, <laughs> I personally think that uh, the fact that you have to have uh, ability to borrow or locate that share, that itself is a friction. And there was an enormous demand, whether it was rational or not, on for game stock. People were lining up to buy. And whereas many people thought that it is overpriced, but they couldn't short it because there were not enough security to short it. So, so in a way, the friction prevented. Now, of course, you know, for months that has been going on. So uh, either the friction is long lasting or there is really some craziness that is taking place over there. But nonetheless, I mean, in general, as economists, we tend to think that if there is a friction for uh, fr friction that prevents you from bringing the price back to rational level, uh, then we, we should try and reduce that friction. But in the shorting market, uh, one friction is the total number of shares available for that stock. And if the demand kind of outstrips, it's, it's difficult for uh, that price to equilibrate, but that's a broader issue. That's a uh, goes beyond the the kind of security lending and the disclosure issues that uh, you focused on, Jonathan. On uh, on which I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. That's great. I am watching the chat here, and there seems to be a lot of interest on ESG and other things such as that. So let's. Talk a bit about some of the things that are uh, perhaps on the radar of these regulatory uh, agencies and climate is going to be, ESG is going to be one of them. Uh, there have been a lot of people weighing in on this space. Certainly, John, you've been a big proponent of it, of looking at this when you were at the SEC. So uh, let's have a, a bit of a discussion. I know there've been panels on this, so I don't want to spend in an inordinate amount of time, but I think our group has a unique perspective on this topic that may not be, uh, uh, may not have been um, noted in other panels. So John, why don't you talk a little bit about your initiatives at the commission under this, uh, uh, looking at ESG climate type of issues. Sure. Um, so when I was on the investor advisory committee, um, uh, we did, 
some work and it to me is pretty clear that the SEC's disclosure regime is long out of date on human capital where the current disclosure requirements are uh, pretty minimal even though they were increased in the last administration uh, with I think SP you were there or you were you came in I forget what, whether the timing was before or after that rule and that that I think was good but even with that there's still pretty minimal relative to the academic research here I'll just note um, showing that the relative contribution of changes in say um, uh, um, earnings for companies that's attributable to disclosed elements of financial statements has declined over time, and that's generally attributed to the rise of human capital as a contribution to, to corporate value. And the FASB, which is the principal body, of course, under the SEC's oversight for setting the financial disclosure rules, has had underway forever, as far as I can tell, um, projects focused in on human capital, and they've made relatively modest changes uh, as a result of those efforts. And I understand why financial accounting is traditionally anchored in transactions and transactions is not often a direct component of the human capital side of the valuation of companies. But for investors, it's therefore even more important if it's not going to be in the financials, I think, for the SEC to have some additional both qualitative and quantitative information required by companies that's relevant to human capital evaluation. So uh, in the the part of the reason I actually took the, the roles that I did last year was to help get that going um, while the new chair was being identified, nominated, and confirmed. We didn't want to waste months and months while that was going on. And so um, uh, Chair Lee uh, put out a request for comment, mostly on climate. I'll say something about that and then I'll subside, uh, but also aimed at uh, broader ESG topics. And I think human capital is one that is um, long, long needed. So hopefully something will come out that will augment what was done under Jay Clayton to add some basic metrics that I think every investor who is at all thoughtful about um, their analysts uh, of various companies would want to know, like turnover rates, sick days, uh, and the like, um, that can help. It's not that it's going to be a slam dunk in, in evaluation, but it's going to be useful to, on the margin, make more consistent and regular disclosure of that kind of information. All right. On climate, similar, um, maybe not quite as longstanding of an obvious gap, but, you know, um, financial economists, again, I'll point to Patrick Bolton to, at the top of the list, but you can go down any number of other current academics who've been able to show real pricing effects right now already using voluntary information that is uh, then estimated for the large number of companies who don't comply with a single SRO regime. And so there's a role there in the, for the SEC in helping make more consistent some basic disclosures that, in fact, most of the S&P 500 companies are already disclosing in some way or the other, but they're doing it in a, with a variety of kinds of templates with a variety of different, and they themselves will complain in private about having to comply with five different reporting regimes. Let's just have one. So that's a different uh, role for the SEC there to bring order to a space where disclosure is already increasingly common. And those are two. There's lots of other ESG topics, but those are the two I expect we'll making out in the next, frankly, month or two, because they're on the uh, SEC's near-term agenda. And so I expect formal rules to be proposed pretty soon. What, one, one last comment I'll throw in. Um, somebody asked about this in the chat. Um, uh, the, the retrospectives versus I, I, I personally think both of these areas, climate and human capital, it would be much better, frankly, if I had to make a choice between advanced comment process and after the fact retrospectives, I'd always choose the latter. But legally, the SEC can't do that. It has to do the upfront comment process by law. And it's actually quite inhibited from doing after the fact retrospectives because in order to get the data to do a retrospective, it has to go through a rulemaking process, which is quite expensive and cumbersome. And if you have no idea what the outcome of that is, it's quite a, it's a there's an inhibition there. So I, if you all could do one thing is reach out to your congressman and tell them to modify the law in some way. I'm not saying like open it all up to have the SEC ask for any information that they ever want but have some process to make it easier for the SEC to do retrospectives. I think that would be a great thing.
I'll stop. All good points, jo uh, John. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, may I, Kathleen? Oh, of course, please, please, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, on climate, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think what companies are doing, and let me call it acts of commission, okay, in terms of uh, what is their carbon footprint, for example. I think those kinds of disclosures are, can be reasonably objective and I can imagine that those can be provided uh, and that, that can be, uh, so whether they're useful or not, but they can be certainly provided and there seems to be some demand. So uh, what is it that a firm uh, do? Uh, and under OSHA or EPA, not OSHA, EPA, uh, there were certain disclosures that were required and one could include climate related. Uh, carbon is one example, but there might be methane or something, methane or something else. Uh, and, and that can be uh, required to be disclosed. Second, which I think many people talk about, and that is what are the risks facing the firm as a result of climate change? And that is far more nebulous and much more difficult in my opinion. For example, a municipal bond for $30 million, if they say that, well, gee, you know, this bond is for next 20 years and this is for sewers or some other things and then rising climate or rising water that might affect and therefore the risk facing that municipal bond investor is affected by that. All of those things might be true, but imagine a municipal bond issuer trying to figure out what might happen 10 or 20 years from now and in that particular area and what, what is the risk of climate, who knows how much we will adapt to that climate change that is taking place and all that. So I think the risks facing a firm as a result of climate change are far more difficult, subjective and nebulous and those we should resist, we should think very carefully. Uh, in the example that I gave about municipal bond, uh, you know, that one simple way might be that uh, each county gets assigned by some federal agency or someone on a risk scale of one to five climate risk. And then the municipal bond issuer can say that, well, we are in risk uh, category two or three or four or five, and that might, uh, be reasonably objective and then the buyer can say that, well, if you're high risk, then maybe a few basis point higher yield should be assigned to that bond. So, so that is the second, that uh, more difficult part is what risk do you face as a result of climate risk? Uh, that, uh, and the third, I think we, we have to uh, recognize and uh, is different industries, they would have different carbon footprints. For example, if you are an oil and gas producer, it's a legal activity. You would have a higher carbon footprint than some other form. And we have to recognize that these disclosures are going to be used by people and they are going to impose certain social or some other costs on these firms. And I think we have to anticipate that and recognize that that the carbon emission or, or some other contribution to climate risk is going to be a function of the industry that you are in and that somehow we should account for it. Otherwise we are uh, needlessly exposing those corporations and therefore uh, overall public to certain higher costs as a result of that. So those are, those are some of the thoughts on ESG. On human capital, I have a very different viewpoint. From an economic standpoint, okay, uh, I think, I think we, we I, I don't know if we are confusing human capital with organizational capital. The reason is the cost of human capital uh, in a competitive setting especially is reflected in the compensation. There is no asset called human capital on the thing, whatever, if, if John Coates is expensive employee, then he gets paid more. And, and that, that is that cost, the expense is reflected in the income statement. 
there is no residual human capital due to John Coates, regardless of how valuable he is on a company for which he is working because he is getting paid for it, right? So the human capital is zero in that sense. Now, if there is some jointness and that, that firms that have John Coates of the world as employees, they have certain, there is some sharing and meaning thereby there is some organizational capital that gets created because that firm has assembled John Coates of the world and they are not paying them their full marginal cost, but some of it gets shared and that organizational capital, maybe so, and maybe that should be reported. I'm, I'm all in favor and that oftentimes in m &A kind of activities that gets lumped into goodwill amount, uh, which for whatever reason we, we say that, hey, you know, we should uh, write it off or that, that's what at least most firm do. So we got that backward over there, uh, but but in terms of the uh, human capital, that's the uh, if 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 the issue is one about organizational capital should somehow be recognized. I'm all for it. Uh, not that it is easy to do that, and it's going to be very subjective. But in concept, conceptually at least, I am all for it. As far as case for human capital, it's less uh, tenable in my mind because we pay in a competitive market employees, their compensation. Yes, I, I want to go back to, to I, go, go ahead, John. Sorry, let me just no. quickly say, I, I agree with SP and I guess I, I was using human capital in the very broad sense to pick up things like organizational capital, where I do think metrics like turnover rates are, are probative. They're not the full picture, but I do think some minimal metrics can complement what companies have already begun to disclose voluntarily. Anyway, Jonathan. Thanks. I was just going to go back to ESG for a second um, and and make the point that, you know, in, in my metaphor of how paint layers interact, when you think about disclosures that might be made by firms, now the question is, how does that affect things like uh, a financial intermediary, whether it's a broker dealer or an investment advisor in terms of their best interest obligation, you know, when they're making recommendations, how do they determine what those ESG metrics mean, right? How to evaluate E versus S versus G, because firms tend to be one or the other or the third, but not all of them. And how does that end up in the process of uh, of, of financial intermediation and, and financial advice. So I, I think this is a really good point. Um, I've recently done some research on how investors look at ESG ratings, for example, and using sort of a shock to assess the analytics rating methodology, we show that investors are confused by, or, or, or blindly rely, let us say, on these ratings, even when information is given to them. So they get a lot of information on how the ratings changed, but they get confused about what the meaning of the ratings change actually is. They inverted the scale. So uh, how do you, this is an issue more in disclosure generally. It's like, you know, the, the primary lever that the SEC has is a disclosure based regime, but you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. And so the question is, how do we make disclosures? There are so many of them and they get more and more mandated. How do we make them relevant to investors that are not institutional or sophisticated to, to retail investors where this is where the majority of the you know, investor protection is supposed to lie? So are there any thoughts about that more generally? One thing I, I would say and it's a way to make a point more generally about ESG, but also to answer your question, Kathleen. You know, Europe is marching forward, and their approach to this topic is quite different than ours, in keeping with, I would say, an overall different approach to regulation there. It, to, to crudely summarize a much more complicated topic, nevertheless, they start with where you just ended and what Jonathan, Jonathan's point. They start with labels that the asset management industry has to use, green, brown, and you know, some other color in between. Uh, and, I, and, and, and basically, the asset managers have to put their portfolio investments into different categories based on a classification that's created by regulation. That then is having backward spillover effects on US companies, because of course, many US companies are cross-listed, and also on US asset managers, because they're in a competitive global 
marketplace for asset management. Um, I like the approach that the SEC is on, which is a little different, which is to start with the public companies and to some extent, maybe the private companies that are overseen by private advisors who are nevertheless raising money from public pension funds and, and, and regulate kind of, let's get some basic information from those companies organized and consistent and reliable. And then we turn to your question, Kathleen, let's make sure that intermediaries are telling the truth to their cl customers and clients about how they're managing the money. Um, I don't have any evidence anybody's currently committing fraud in this space, but you can imagine that over time there will be temptations uh, for managers to, you know, either exaggerate, slightly confuse, uh, do lots of things to confuse their customers, attract a green, a green oriented clientele, and then actually not really carry through on that. That I think is going to be more likely to be the SEC's path. Um, it's probably not going to do what Europe's going to do in terms of brown, green funds, et cetera. But I go back to that because we are going to live in a world in which those classifications are going to start affecting our capital markets. And that's another reason I think that this, you know, kind of and from a research perspective, this space is really quite important to be paying attention to. So if I, if I may, um, this gives me an opportunity to go back to John's comment about the difficulty that the SEC has in doing retrospective reviews. Um, one of the benefits of the SRO model is that we're not subject to the APA and some of the other constraints that the commission has. And so what that permits us to do is go back and look fairly carefully at rules that have been put in place and sort of say, are they doing what they what we thought they were gonna do? Has the market changed in, in important ways? Um, and I say that as a precursor to the following point is that there is evidence that even if it, that in, in some circumstances, there is evidence that even where uh, retail investors may not be looking at the information directly, it could still generate benefits. So I'm thinking about a paper, uh, there's a, a Bomer paper at all a number of years back about the implementation of what was then um, dash five and dash six data, the, the, the data about uh, order routing. And it was the, when the SEC promulgated those rules, they said providing retail investors better information on the, on the cost of trading, the indirect costs of trading will help inform them. And it turned out that making the data available created um, a mechanism where firms could see where they were relative to each other. And as a result, behaviors changed. Even if retail investors were not looking at those data directly, behaviors changed. And we've, we've sort of used that as an idea to go back and say, when you create a disclosure, um, recently the MSRB and FINRA adopted rules uh, sort of side by side that require broker dealers to provide a retail investor the markup or markdown that's associated with a fixed income transaction. So basically, um, if it's in a principal basis, you wouldn't see any commission on the trade. And so it looked like it was costless to investors. And so one way to think about what it's really cost them is the, is the difference between, let's say, what they got for, for the bond that they sold and what their broker got by reselling the same bond. That difference is the markup on the bond and, and it, it provides an estimate of the remuneration to the broker dealer. And so the question is when you start to require broker dealers to provide that information to their clients, what happens? Well, the top of the distribution actually shrinks, right? There is a real reaction. We also want to see, by the way, whether it creates a coordinating mechanism that the bottom of the distribution may also shrink as well, an unintended, potential unintended kind of consequence of this kind of disclosure. But you can go and check that in the data. You can go and check that by talking uh, and, and collecting information from brokers about what their policies are, how they've implemented it. And as a result, you can actually test in many, in many instances um, whether the disclosures intended for retail customers is actually having impact. So this is great. Um, I want to move then toward this payment for order flow. This issue is quite relevant to what you just spoke about in the sense that, you know, customers 
don't always understand what a zero commission means and that zero commissions does not necessarily mean that it is free. Um, so SP, you've just been uh, just put out a working paper on this topic. And I know Jonathan, you've been overseeing and been involved in research on, on it as well. And I thought maybe we could take a moment to talk about some of the issues that are here and what some of the evidence or concerns that regulators might have about uh, payment for order flow and the incentives it might create on, you know, for the gamification, so to speak, of securities trading by smaller retail customers. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, there are several issues here. Okay, so first, first let me uh, give you my understanding of payment for order flow. Uh, suppose I'm a retail investor and I send my um, buy order to Schwab or to Robinhood uh, and they take those orders and that order flow, they take it to <clears throat> some executives like uh, Citadel or Virtu or someone. And these intermediaries, Schwab or Robinhood or those, they not only take my order, but a bunch of other orders and that entire flow they might take to, to the executive, right? And clearly that order flow is beneficial to uh, citadels of the world and they pay for that order flow and that payment is called payment for order flow and that payment is received by by say Schwab or by uh, Robinhood and Robinhood and Schwab then in turn they say that if anybody who trades through them commission is zero okay so that is the uh, that is payment for order flow in in my opinion this Payment for order flow has been around for decades. So it's not a new phenomenon. It has attracted more attention recently, but it has been around. Uh, it's like commission received by intermediaries. Uh, in other businesses also, uh, intermediaries receive commission. And payment for order flow, in my opinion, is it, it has a lot of similarities. As whenever this issue came up, my first question is, is the market competitive? There clearly is conflict of interest. There's no question about it. Meaning thereby that if Schwab or Robinhood receives that payment from say Virtu or from Citadel, then that payment might influence them, their decision where to route those orders. Okay. So that is the conflict of interest, right? Now, as I said, there is clearly conflict of interest, but there is also competition. Is the market, is the structure, market structure here competitive? In which case, in spite of this conflict, it might just serve as commission received for the services that they are providing. And, and that, that might benefit ultimately the retail investor. So what we do in our study is ask the question, what is the price that retailers receive when they are routing it, retail trades, when they are in these dark, dark uh, pools uh, <clears throat> on these not lit markets versus on exchanges, off exchanges versus exchanges. And we look at what is the execution quality and what we find is that execution quality, if anything, is slightly better at off exchanges, meaning thereby going through uh, Schwab or Robin Hood or those and, and to uh, <clears throat> order flowing through them uh, is better compared to on exchanges. Now you might ask, well, what is the economic rationale for that? Well, off exchanges, almost all the uh, order flow is from retail investors who are not informed. So Citadel or Virtu, when they take that, they don't have to worry about trading against informed, potentially informed Traders. They are less concerned about that. Whereas institutional trades, when they are brought to any on even on exchanges, then the other side market maker has to worry a little bit about that it might be informed. So the fact that retail trades are more likely to be uninformed, they receive a slightly better price off exchanges than 
the price that they might have received or retail trades receive on exchange. That is the evidence. And this is in the presence of payment for order flow. So uh, I'm going to pause here. So if, if I can join the conversation, let me start by um, violently agreeing with SP on the notion that the fact that a conflict exists doesn't mean that it necessarily manifests itself in, in loss or cost uh, to customers. I think that's an empirical question. And I think SP's paper is, is a thoughtful piece and it's one piece of evidence. And to his point, one of the things that you may wanna do is think about more, looking at, at the evidence more broadly. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, um, it's a complicated story, right? The, the, first of all, you can't look at payment for order flow without thinking about the other potential choices that a broker has in its routing decision. Um, exchanges have make take and take make fees. Uh, and it's hard to look at those fees in the absence of the choices that the broker would make in the presence of payment for order flow. Brokers also may have the option of sending the order to their to an affiliated uh, ATS or or dark pool, right? And there there are other conflicts of interest because they're going to if they can create more liquidity in their own trading venues, they may be able to generate more fees from from other order flow. And the problem is you very quickly go down this uh, boil the ocean problem. And so what you need to do is think about um, the choices that brokers have when they receive, when they receive order flow and, and what they may choose to do with it. Work that I've been involved with, uh, I've got a paper with Ambar Anand, um, Murdad Samadhi and uh, Kumar Venkabraman, where we show that the execution quality for order institutional orders, so it's not retail orders, but institutional orders that get sent to affiliated ATSs is worse than order flow that's sent to other places by institutional orders that are, you know, that are matching order flows that are, that are sent to other locations. Um, there is a paper that, that we had a chance to, to present at the um, American Econ Econometric Association meetings yesterday, where we're showing that for um, off exchange trades, there is a burst of activity, both, um, well, let me stop and start and say this, there is a structural difference in the way that off exchange trades get reported to the public versus the way that exchange trades get reported to the public. And as a result, there's about a 2,500 microsecond lag in the reporting of off exchange trades. Um, and it's, as I said, it's just sort of, it, it's, it, it's built into the process. Uh, if, if Citadel ex executes a trade, it gets sent to the TRF, the trade reporting facility, and from the TRF, it goes on to the SIP where it's made public. We can demonstrate that there is a burst of quote and trade activity on the exchanges in response to the publication of those trades. And we can show a burst of activity in that preceding 2,500 microseconds, which suggests that, that in some cases, brokers may be sweeping across um, lit and dark markets, or they may be able to use the information that they can glean from those trades and update their quotes and, and trade before that information actually hits the market, right? I think, I think there is increasing evidence that there is information content in retail trade it may be very short lived. It may, you know, it 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 may not be highly predictive for very long, um, but it appears as if it's getting used in some sense. And 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 this activity may not be in violation of of current rules, but I think it's really incumbent upon us to understand it, and and what it means. So it, you know, there is this this debate though. I mean, what does it mean though for for things like the GameStop issue? Um, whereby retail investors, you say they get better prices and it's great, but the fact that it's free, I mean, I've learned this from doing many, many conferences. You know, the minute it's free, it doesn't mean anything. But you make people take, pay 20 bucks to come to your conference, by God, they're there. I don't know why 20 bucks matters, but it does, right? So you make people pay for something and there is then some thought going into how much uh, they want to actually uh, do. And so, 
does the fact that these this this payment for order flow or make or taker fees can do the same thing uh, allow retail investors to overtrade as we saw in GameStop or does it and does it make the job of investor protection right of the SEC more difficult because obviously it's not a merit based uh, organization. They can't say you should or should not buy a particular security. There's rules um, for disclosure, but not for that. So what is, how does a regulator face this challenge and what do they do about it? And I think this is going to, you know, lead us right into the crypto space as well, because I do think that these issues are in that space. It's a more complicated space because it's not clear where the jurisdiction for crypto assets lies. The SEC has obviously made some points about that. But uh, again, investors are clearly have an appetite to be engaged in trading activities that may not be in their best interest. And how does a regulator best address that problem? So I don't have strong views on payment for order few myself so that's why I was quiet but I, I will throw out two quick thoughts one is not entirely right to say the SEC's only role is disclosure it also has as a part of its core mission um, the protection of orderly markets and that might mean sometimes stopping people from doing what they otherwise want to do um, in ways that aren't just about disclosure if that activity disrupts orderly markets. So I just wanna make that quick point. We have circuit breakers, for example, that nobody really fights about anymore. They were very controversial when they were being discussed, but they clearly block trading in ways that are beyond uh, disclosure. Um, uh, the second thing I wanna say about this is I share your intuition, Kathleen, that um, the appeal to getting cost of trading as absolutely low as possible has never really to me been very compelling i i get it i mean you know lots of trading even tiny costs they add up it's a social cost you know in general it's, it's a legitimate thing for the agency to want the private markets to continue to optimize on but that's the key point is that they should be optimizing on it not driving it zero or worse nominally below where the actual costs are being borne in some much more transparent or opaque way such as um, you know uh, churning uh, to put a fine point on it um, having my mother-in-law who thankfully no longer does this but for many years uh, was the perfect victim of people aiming uh, things at day trader type people and she just, you know, she actually made money often, but her total trading costs, you know, eventually, even though, you know, she was trading to the lowest cost possible platforms, the price realization, price impact, and just the general uh, regularity that the more people trade, the more they lose at the retail. Uh, you know, to me, I just, I think it's a much more complicated issue, unfortunately, than it often gets framed as, which is just how can we keep the cost as low as possible? So I'll stop. I couldn't agree more with uh, that excessive trading can erode your performance. Now, the question is how paternalistic we want to be, or how, how much or <clears throat> uh, for the SEC to, to do these things, or should we just keep broadcasting that excessive trading is injurious to your financial health? kind of thing and leave it at that. I mean, you know, so that that is, I don't have necessarily an answer to it, but to me, that certainly is an issue. And second, we don't know yet. I think we, this is where I think research would be helpful is to what extent the lower costs have led to excessive trading to the financial ruin of investors. We don't know that, you know, and and that would be, research that would be helpful to shed light on that issue. So, so those, those are the uh, two points. And um, yeah, I think, I think that that's, let me pause there. So SP, I, I actually agree with you that, that firms should be able to compete on 
different dimensions. I think the thing that's difficult, again, personally, is that the information that's received by um, investors is, is sort of limited to the direct costs of trading, right? And so it's unclear when, tr when direct trading costs get pushed down to zero, is it because of competition or is it because those direct, the, the direct remuneration is being replaced by some other remuneration that can't be seen, right? Directly, you know, easily by investors. And, and one of the things that I think you know, a long time in government has taught me is if you don't know what you're paying for a good or services, you're probably paying more than you think. And so I, I do think this is a place where, where, where disclosure, like thoughtful, careful disclosure might be helpful because I don't think that, I think people view, as I said, you know, this goes back to Arthur Levitt who used to tell the story of his mother trading bonds because, it, because the bond trade were, were being done on a principal basis, they were basically free. Well, they weren't, but there was no indication of what, of what that cost was. No, no, nobody, nobody believes that when the out of commission, out of pocket commission is zero, that the cost is zero. I mean, there, there might be some people who believe that, but most of us, we, we understand that you know, and we simultaneously say that all these intermediaries are making too much money. So, I mean, there have to be some way they are making money, right? So, so nobody is so naive to believe that this is literally free, okay? So I, I think that that part, we let us not beat the dead horse. So that's not what it is. What, what really the issue is, is the alternative superior. You, you want to get rid of payment for order, you meaning not you personally, but I'm saying in general, when that is. Is the alternative any better? We are not going to get that there is zero. I mean, the, the cost is going to be there. The, the real issue is why does this structure evolve? And are there some guardrails to prevent some barrier to uh, so, uh, um, prevent the conflict of interest or, or pocketing some money? That, that's what the real issue is. is the, structure sufficiently competitive or not that and and the the example that you gave about institutional traders they going and they they okay. suppose let me say stipulate that okay that evidence is accurate but it flies in the face of why would those institutional investors repeatedly go i mean i can understand retail investors being fooled but they if you're saying that these institutional investors, they know the whole thing and repeatedly they are getting fooled by these. So either they are, they are suffering from some conflict of interest or something else is going on. It cannot be that, that something simple as, oh, these guys are being taken advantage of because of whatever the, you know, they are routing uh, these trades to their personal private benefit, these brokers. It's, it's transparent, you know that, the institutional investors know that, the brokers know that, and if this happens repeatedly, the problem is somewhere else, right? I, so, well, so, I, so I, yeah, I, no, I, look, okay. So I, I, I take your point that, that yeah. the straw horse of, of things are costless was, was a bit strong, and I don't mean that, but, but look, no, no. but the evidence that suggests that there's some, let's say, uh, increase in, in price improvement is only partially helpful if you don't know what you're paying for it. Right? And, it, and it turns out, quite honestly, even in the institutional setting, it is incredibly difficult to know what you're paying for your execution services, in part because the brokers are the, are the gatekeepers of that information to their clients. So if it, is in, if it is incredibly difficult, then the right answer here is that we don't know. And I, I'm fine with that. But let us not jump to the conclusion that we know that the problem is Payment and, for order. And, and with this, I, I agree you with didn't you. Say I, that. You didn't yeah. say that, but there are many others who are saying it. And I'm just saying that, you know, if, 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 if it's incredibly difficult, how do they know that payment for order flow is a problem then? <laughs> so. Again, violent agreement. <laughs> So I want to, we're going to wrap up here, but I want to do spend a few minutes at least on the crypto space. And I don't think we're going to debate whether or not they're securities. I think there's some evidence that they might not be or some that are, John might want to weigh in that. But there is some concern that investors are not really being very protected in this particular space. 
Uh, there are some potential frictions on broker dealers holding custody of these types of assets. Uh, what can what can regulators do either in the space of of information, making sure that 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 uh, uh, investors in these assets have the appropriate disclosures or information to make an investment decision, and that trading these assets can be more efficient and and better protected. So uh, this, I think, spans everybody who's here. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. And then we're going to wrap up uh, with some thoughts about how you can become more involved in the regulatory process. Um. So let me take a first pass through the um, anxiety producing crypto debates. Anxiety producing, let me just note, because many of the people who are interested in crypto are insane. I mean, literally insane. And a large number of those who are not insane like to repeat the talking points of those people who are insane. And and if it were just like words, no big deal, but actually they target and harass and are quite uh, unhelpful to over open debate when people raise legitimate questions about the crypto space. So right, we're not talking about vaccinations that. here. We're talking about crypto. No, <laughs> the first time I encountered how hostile the social media world could be was not talking about Donald Trump or politics or any of the other many hot button issues that exist in the world where, you know, you get like people attacking you, but it's usually on the merits to some, or they just call you profanity and you can ignore that. It was the crypto folks where I got tagged for just like a casual comment about, I wanted to see a use case. And I got then like 3000 people coming at me like repeatedly over the course of two days, clearly a, like a somewhat orchestrated campaign. It's not helpful, let me just say, to people who believe in the future of crypto having a legitimate role in the world to act that way or to ally with people who act that way. I just wanted to make that point because um, I know there are probably, at least among the younger folks of the audience here, many people who really like to think that crypto is the future. I will just say, not in my regulatory role, but just as a casual citizen of the world, the use cases for crypto to me remain mysterious. Uh, they consist of ledger technology, which has existed since, you know, spreadsheets were invented and the Internet existed. You know, one, two, three by Lotus, you know, from 1985 does a lot of what publicly available ledgers can do. So then then you move to the uh, open idea of it, like where it's open ledgers um, and uh, non permission where. Um, You've got to put a lot of faith in, in the governance of the activity that generates the resulting data to really feel comfortable about that playing a major role in the world. Uh, and so far, at least, I haven't seen any compelling cases that we want to turn our banking system over to the technology or our overall transactions to the technology or, or even uh, capital raising to the technology. Rather, people seem still mainly really to be interested in permissioned uh, a blockchain, which you don't really need blockchain for that. All right, so I'll stop on the use case side. The one, the one good use case is if you live in Lebanon and your ATM machines all shut down and you have no way of moving your money out of the country, I get it. And okay, so there's a, there's a use case, but that would suggest a relatively modest role for the asset in the world, far smaller than what we've got. Now let me pivot to the SEC piece, uh, which is you invited me to, Kathleen. Um, you know, we've got an existing legal regime. It's been applied to everything from ostrich farms to, you know, you name it, anything that people can come up with as a way to speculate or generate speculative future returns. People have tried to do things to get around the securities laws, and we have securities law tests that are designed to cope with that. And crypto is no different. All the, the uh, 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 various ways that crypto has been used in this space either are securities. Uh, and there are many that are, in which case the answer is not that you can't do it. You just have to comply with the security clause, which typically forbid fraud and require some disclosure. All right. So there's that. Um, or they're not securities like Bitcoin, where there is no concentrated group of people serving as the as the uh, focus of the activity. And and then it's just not for the SEC to regulate it at all. Right. It's for the CFTC at best or for some or maybe a banking regulator, but not the SEC. Now, that's my first answer. The final, the second answer, and I'll be brief on this, is given that it exists, 
given that there's lots of assets that may or may not be securities because they haven't been fully tested in, a, in an adjudication, um, there's exchanges, there's custody operations, there's broker dealers, and there's some bank activity all trading in this space. That, I think, is a much harder set of questions for the SEC, which is how to think about those intermediaries in their activities where they touch on crypto assets, given that those crypto assets are very difficult to um, audit, to, 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 in fact, test custody. Like, how, what does it even mean to say you have custody of certain kinds of crypto assets? Uh, and you go down the list. How, how do you fulfill your broker-deal obligation of suitability when the asset itself is mysterious to some extent. And so I, I just I think those are all the really difficult challenges that the current commission is facing. I know Jay Clayton in the prior administration and even the prior SEC wrestled with those for the past 12 years. And it's these there are no simple answers to those questions. I'll stop. In broad agreement with you, John, on, on all of those issues and the legal part is I'm uh, less knowledgeable and less familiar, no, not familiar, but less knowledgeable about. Uh, in terms of the technology, I think the, uh, it's true that, you know, some people are overly enamored by it. Uh, I'm not, but that doesn't mean that I know it. You know, so I, whether I should be or not, I don't know, I'm agnostic about it. But what I do know is that if there is some benefit of technology here, Okay, that will get spill over, spilled over to the traditional market also. So, and, and I, I think therefore we should not resist it and we will benefit from it. We will meaning the society will benefit from it. The traditional, whether a central bank issues a digital currency or not, or just a dollar and all the digital transactions that take place right now, uh, if there is some benefit, either greater security or whatever the benefit is from the, the blockchain or whatever technology that cryptocurrencies might use, uh, that's not going to be limited to crypto. That is that technology would have broader application. And if it is beneficial, that competition from cryptos will spill over and the rest of the currency markets would benefit from it. So that is, that is uh, point one. And in terms of, you, you, you're absolutely right, you know, that whether there are issues of um, what is the taxable income from uh, cryptocurrency trading, or is there custody or not, is there fraud or not, you know, those are, those are issues I think uh, we, we should try and grasp them and try to chase down answers to them rather than trying to disallow and the reason I say is that for whatever reason, people have chosen to use these cryptos as a storage of value, okay? There is a couple trillion dollars, $3 trillion of crypto market all over. And we should try to legitimize it. At the same time, warn everybody that this is an incredibly risky market. And the prices of some of these might go down to zero in, in a jiffy, who knows, right? So risks are involved in that. So buyer beware, and, and, uh, but, but transparency is needed. Uh, final point, very briefly, as far as liquidity and transparency, I looked at some of these markets and the bidder spreads are ridiculously low. I mean, they, they are rid ridiculously, I don't say it, say it in any negative way, but saying that they are really small. Bitcoin and some other mm, currencies that are traded very actively, uh, the bid spreads are like five basis points. So, so that's now you can say that, well, five basis points is still too high, but, but the point is that they are quite low. Okay. So, so that, that's where, so there is a reasonable amount of transparency, notwithstanding fact that there are questions about custody and some other issues. And, and we clearly should try and uh, get answers to that or, or devote resources to find answers to those questions. So I think one of the really interesting larger questions is the sort of the path that innovation in financial products take. 
right? Um, new, new products typically, at least in the United States, start as, as bilateral contracts and then they grow. Uh, and, it, and it's most efficient to deal with them as bilateral contracts until they get to be large enough that, that there's a need for regulatory structure over it. But that creates this messy problem of, you know, sort of when do you apply that regulatory structure and how do you apply it to a market that's already developed and grown in the absence of it? Right? Um, regulatory structures, one of the things that they do is they, they impose costs for the, for the benefit of, of the participants. Okay, so let me make let me make one other specific point, right? For, and it is from the perspective of broker dealers. Um, today, they can offer products that are not securities to customers, like mutual funds, well, securities, I guess. But but um, let's say uh, interest rate swap contracts or or things like that, and they can and they can do that not as a broker dealer, but as a, a bucket of services that they're providing to their customers. In most of those cases today, those other products are regulated by somebody. And so that there is some set of rules ensuring that there are disclosures and that those disclosures are fair and complete and that kind of stuff. The problem we're at right now, as more and more people are interested in cryptos as it grows as an asset class, is that even as traditional intermediaries are providing services, it's coming without those kinds of additional protections. And it's unclear whether customers understand the limits of the protections when they go through trusted parties. Great points. It's another, another good example of how regulation has to choose sometimes between regulating activities versus regulating uh, you know, a, a particular asset or, 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 or that some such thing like that. So thank you all. I want to just take this last few minutes, um, SP and Jonathan, for you to tell a little bit to our audience on how they might become more involved with the SEC or with FINRA, either by visiting, taking a permanent position. Um, and so they might have some, some interest in joining the organizations. Jonathan, why don't we start with you and then SP, we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you, Kathleen. So our function is growing. I'm looking to hire 10 people. Um, probably is going to take me more, uh, more than this year to do it, but, I, but uh, we're looking for experts in market structure and equities and in fixed income and in options. Uh, we're interested in people who understand uh, consumer behavior in the financial security space. Uh, that's going to help us think about things like how you test disclosures and, and whether they're effective or not. Uh, you can look at for FINRA's website to see where position when we have positions open. If not, you can uh, contact me directly, Jonathan Sokoven at FINRA.org. And uh, we would love to talk to you about opportunities that might exist within our shop. All right, SP, you want to tell a little bit about how uh, academics in particular can visit the SEC? I mean, uh, that's something I think a lot of people are interested in. Uh <clears throat> Yeah, it's just a, you know, my two years experience at least, you know, it's came away thinking very highly of it. It's a great, very professional place. Um, it's a large place. Uh, DIRA itself had 160 uh, professionals in it, 70 of them were PhDs. So uh, there is, there is, um, there's camaraderie, there is a, a constituency there that is large enough that you can blend uh, very nicely. Uh, the range of breadth of topics uh, on investment management or markets uh, or on corporate finance issues. Uh, in each of those, there is a decent uh, pool there of, of individuals who are interested in those topics. So it's a great place. Uh, by way of visiting, uh, you can be an academic fellow and have spend a year there, sort of try, try it out. And that can lead to a more permanent job. Uh, but SEC, routinely hires people, rookies, uh, as well as those who are somewhat seasoned, uh, individuals at AFA, as well as FMA meetings. Uh, and there's a usual application procedure and, and they do that. Uh, at SEC itself, there is there are very regular seminars from outside speaker. So you can maintain your research activity. Uh, clearly, SEC is the kind of place where 
uh, you, you are not free to do research you know, most of the time. I mean, you know, there is some amount of research and there is some amount of expectation that you would spend time on rulemaking aspects of the work. Uh, so it's not uh, a place where you say that, well, you know, 50 or 70 or 80% of my time, I will do my own research. That's simply not going to happen. On the other hand, uh, very policy relevant work with a group of other individuals and at the same time, by uh, doing that policy relevant work, you are trying to stay abreast of research and that activity uh, uh, through seminars, through reading of research papers, through conversations with other professionals, both inside and outside, you can, you can stay current. Uh, BC is a beautiful place to uh, live. So, I, so all in all, I have very good things to say. And SEC does pay a decent amount too. So, <laughs> so I'll leave you uh, with the the SEC. Um, uh, I and I and, and the University of Maryland and the CFA Institute put together a conference every May. Uh, it is slated for May six. This will be virtual this year, um, and it covers all aspects: asset management, financial intermediaries, markets, and corporate finance. Uh, we encourage you to um, attend that if you're interested in financial market regulation, and that will be on May 6th. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It was an extremely interesting discussion. We are so pleased we could get you know, such distinguished panelists. It has been uh, a testimony to the organization as well as to the networking of former regulators that allows us to do that. So thank you so very much. And I appreciate your time as I'm sure the AFA does as well. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your weekend. Thanks. Thanks, Bye thank now. you so much. Bye.